turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 10. Uh, so the Gospel of John is the fourth uh, Gospel in the New Testament. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. So it's not very difficult to find, but maybe you're kind of new to the Bible. That's the easy way to find it. So uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, then John. And John 10 here, we'll be spending just about our entire day in John 10. I have a few other scriptures sprinkled in there like I always do for flavor. Uh, but the majority of our time we're going to spend in John chapter 10. Um, and in this chapter, we, or we find Jesus sharing a story, a parable per se, uh, with Pharisees, actually. He's trying to teach them about what it means to be a good shepherd. And that's what, we, what I've titled the, the message today is The Good Shepherd. Uh, so today as we go through here, I'm just praying that God will uh, show us the truth through His Word uh, to encourage us, to uplift us, and to move us in the right direction. And I am so grateful to be able to present this Word to you. Uh, so beginning at verse 1, if you could, please stand with me if you could here. And we're going to open up and just stand for the reading of the word, and then we will pray thereafter. Beginning with verse 1. It says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by in some other ways, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate uh, is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls to his own sheep by, the na- by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the work that you are doing in our hearts already, and I pray, Lord, you continue to do that work inside of us. I pray, Lord, that you give us ears to hear and a mind to understand and a heart to receive what it is that you're trying to speak to us today. I pray, Lord, you help me to be the vessel that I can possibly be for you, God, speaking through me your words. So, Lord, again, I just thank you for all that you're doing. And we just give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may, you may be seated. So during Jesus' earthly ministry here on earth, he liked to use stories from everyday life to bring forth the information and the understanding uh, of spiritual truths. And, and in this right here, this, this, this chapter 10 was no different, that he used these talk, his talk about sheep and livestock uh, to, re, to, to illustrate a spiritual truth. You know, and one of the things that we have to keep in mind is whenever things are being talked about in the Bible, we have to put it in context the events that were going on. So the people of the Bible times, they were very much as an agriculture society. So that, it was not foreign to them that they began to talk about livestock or uh, crops of raising or sheep herding or anything like that. These were not foreign things to them. Even if they were not shepherds themselves, even if they didn't own a sheep, they had a working understanding of what sheep uh, sheep raising, shepherding, all these different things. They had a working understanding about what was going on. And I keep that in mind because some of you guys may not have grown up on the hills of Jerusalem raising sheep. Am I right on that assumption? Most of you guys have not? Okay. Neither have I. So I'll get you off the hook thinking I am the, the end-all, be-all to understanding this thing. But as I studied this out this week, I started looking at things in a physical aspect but also in a spiritual aspect, because I really want to understand what God's telling us right here. And I think as we dive through this, we'll start understanding little by little about all the, the, the great things that Jesus is trying to, re, to illustrate to the Pharisees this day. Um, so one of the things to keep in mind, the sheep in this region were not contained by fences like we have today. Where farmers have a fence, the next farmer has a fence, and you keep your sheep to yourself they didn't have that. It was free-range sheep herding, and so it was a free-for-all. Every, sh- every shepherd could take their sheep wherever they wanted to go, as far as they wanted to go, to whatever brook they wanted to go to. There really was no rules as far as that goes. So every single day, what the, sheep, or what the shepherd would do is at the end of the day, he would corral his flock, his, his herd rather, uh, or I guess it would be flock, br- bring the sheep into a sheep pen. So then the sheep pen did not just house one shepherd's flock. It was many, many shepherds that bring their flocks all into this pen. This enclosure is what it was. 
they brought them in at night to protect the sheep throughout the nighttime. And there, every single sheep pen that was in that region had only one gate. There was only one passageway to enter into this protective area, the sheep pen. And one of the cool things about this sheep pen is it gave the, the shepherds a break. The shepherds can drop off their sheep, and a, a, a gatekeeper was put in place right there to watch over that door, that gate, that entryway. And it was his job to watch over the sheep and make sure no one was going to come in and steal the sheep throughout the night. Wolves, thieves, etc. Was they were watching for these different things all day or all night long. And the interesting thing about this uh, gatekeeper is he was very familiar with each shepherd. He recognized the shepherds that, be, that, that owned the sheep that was under his care. So anyone that tried to come in through the gate and says, Oh, hi, I'm uh, Farmer Joe. No, you're not. I know who Farmer Joe is. That's not you, and you have to get out of here. So most thieves would understand that, well, that's not going to work, because this guy knows each farmer by name and by face. So they would come in through the outside, through the, through the, through the walls, or through, the, through the fences, and try to climb over these fences to steal sheep. Well, again, the, sheep hurt, the, the shepherds as well as the gatekeeper kept a keen watch out for these type of thieves. You know, by morning time, the, the gatekeeper would be on lookout looking for the shepherds to come to return to grab their sheep that morning. And it was kind of neat that as soon as the shepherd began to approach, the gatekeeper would just open the gate and allow the shepherd to enter in. No questions were asked because he had a rightful place to those sheep. He, they belonged to him. And what's interesting in our passages that we've already read so far is how the sheep were separated. So, see, back then they didn't have ear tags like we have today to separate your sheep from my sheep and la da da da. There wasn't no branding on a sheep because that that's, doesn't work at all either. So the way that they did, began to distinguish between your sheep and my sheep and whoever else's sheep is in that pen that night, that day was by the shepherd's voice. We can see that again in verse four. Look at that again, four and five, with me for just a second. When he had brought out all his own sheep and, and goes ahead of them, the sheep follow him. Because they know his voice. Stop there for just a second. There is no possible way that a sheep can learn a shepherd's voice without spending time with the shepherd. The shepherd was out there in the fields day after day after day providing for the sheep. They knew the shepherd's voice. They knew exactly the tone of his voice. They knew what kind of language and dialect that he used. You know, and it says the Bible says, you know, that they call him by name. Now, I don't know if every sheep had his own particular name. I don't know. Not a shepherd. I'm just saying, hey, the Bible says the shepherd knows your name. I'm going to take that to the bank. The, the Bible says I know that God knows your name. And he begins to speak it. Verse 5 kind of twists things up a little bit because it says, but they will never follow a stranger. And that's interesting because we always think about sheep being not, the, not so bright. And I don't know if that's why God relates us to be sheep sometimes, but I'm hoping not. But it says they will not follow a stranger because when they hear the stranger's voice, they don't go inside and say, well, let's find out about this guy. Maybe he's better than my shepherd. Let's go and just be inquisitive and just get kind of close to hear what the shepherd has, this new shepherd has to say. It says they will run away. And that's what you guys really need to understand. When a shepherd comes into your life that's not speaking the shepherd's voice and speaking the shepherd's language, run don't hesitate, don't pause, don't, don't speculate. Run for the hills for all you have because that person is called a thief. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. But I love that the sheep recognized the shepherd's voice. You know, I tell people that I hear God talk to me. And New Christians, and even those that are unsaved, look at me like I have three heads, like, no, nah, you don't hear God talk to you. But I do. I've never heard God's audible voice. It's in my spirit when God speaks, I can listen. And it wasn't something that I did automatically. It took time, honestly. And like some of you guys that may don't understand how to re hear God's voice yet, you're like, how do I hear God's voice? I'll take you to the same place that God took me. Go back to his word. This is the shepherd's voice speaking to us so clearly. 
so clearly that we can understand it. So when we hear the shepherd beginning to speak this voice, these words, this encouragement, we're like, that sounds familiar. Where have I heard that before? Oh, that's right. It's right here. So if you don't already have a consistent, and that's the key word, consistent time in the Word every single day, I encourage you to do so because if you want to hear God's voice, and I know most of you guys in this place do want to hear God's voice and hear it more clearly, get in the Word. Get in the Word. Get in the Word. Stay in the Word. Do what the Word says and allow it to change who you are. Open up those spiritual ears that you begin to hear what God's saying to you because God is always speaking. I mean, we went through this morning with the, with the testimonies. God's always showing us things. He's always speaking. He's always doing something. But sometimes our attention is not there. Sometimes we completely miss what God's doing because of distractions, because of a different agenda, because of these different things. God begins to, or, or, or the devil begins to confuse us and gets our mind off of it. We have to clear out the clutter of our mind and to allow God to even speak and for us to hear God. So get in the Word, church, so you can learn and identify what the, 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 the shepherd's voice sounds like. So what was Jesus' point to everything that we've read so far, 1 through 6? And that's kind of the same question that the Pharisees were asking that day. All right, what are you saying? I don't get it. And I can't really throw stones at the Pharisees today because there's sometimes when God speaks to me, I go, huh? Try that one again. So I can't say anything like the Pharisees were bad people because some things go over my head. I have to have God to reiterate them a different way. And I'm thankful that, you know, we can see that in verse 6, you know, it says uh, they don't understand what, what Jesus was telling them. So he says it another way. And... Uh, the Bible doesn't say it this way, but this is just the way I look at it. I can see Jesus going, ah, okay, we'll try this a different way. The Bible doesn't say it that way, and I'm sure he's gracious and he's loving. And, but the Bible does say at one point, how much longer will I put up with you people? And uh, it shows that he does have a human side and probably a little bit of a, you know, a humorous side as well. But verse 10, or verse 7 rather, in John 10, it says, Therefore Jesus said again. And this is the cool part right now. That if you miss something with God, he doesn't throw you away. He doesn't say, you are too dumb for me to use. Point right here, okay? If he can use me, I guarantee he can use you. So he says, you know what? I want you to understand what I'm saying to you. So let's pause for a second. I'm going to say it a different way. Go further into depth because when we have those further explanation, we can grab a hold of all of that spiritual goodness that God has for us. So he says, Very truly I tell you that I am the gate for the sheep. All of you have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come, out, come and go out and find pasture. Now I know some of you guys might be sitting here for a minute going, wait a minute, I thought Jesus was a shepherd, not the gate. Okay, pause for a second. You have to understand what Jesus was saying in this moment. When the, when the time came and shepherds took their sheep further than they can travel back to the sheep pen for the night, shepherds would find a cave or a crevice in a rock somewhere that he can put the sheep for the night that's safe. And he himself became the gate. He would literally lay down on the ground to, to make sure that anything and everyone that wants to come hurt those sheep would have to go through him to do so. So when he was beginning to say that I am the gate, I am the opening, I am the doorway, everyone has to go through me to get to my sheep. That's what he's saying here. If you skip down, to verse 11 for just a moment it says exactly what i just was saying to you it says i am the good shepherd a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep and when we read that here in this context we think calvary we think when jesus laid down his life on the cross for us and there's nothing wrong with that understanding but you have to put it into perspective the people that were listening that day had no idea calvary was coming that hasn't taken place yet 
But they understood that the shepherd, Jesus Christ here, was saying, I am willing to, to lay down my life. Not that I already have, not that I, uh, that I might. I am willing to, I will lay down my life for the sheep. And this is so important for us to understand that the, the, the love that Jesus has for us, and I love us, uh, that we have the opportunity to have communion together this morning. That, that reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus made on, cro- on the cross for us. The beatings, the scorn, the, 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 the crown of thorns in his head. All these things that he went through there was to protect us, to make us stronger, to give us life to the full. No one stole Jesus' life. I don't know if you understand that, really. No one literally says, you have to do this. He says, I lay it down. And if you skip down to 17 through 19, it says this, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. Verse 18, no one takes it from me. No one takes Jesus' life from him, but he lays it down on his own accord. Wow, what a level of love. It's one thing to be sentenced to death when you have no control to it. It's another thing to say, you know what, I'm going to die in their place. I love them so much, I want to die in their place. And that's exactly what the good shepherd did. He says, I am willing to, I have, I will continue to do this. Be the gate that no one else can come to the Father. We can see that later on. That this passageway called Jesus is the only way To enter into the sheep pen, you have to go through the gate. Jesus was willing to lay down his life for hours. And this is another great picture for church leadership. Church leaders, I'm I'm talking directly to all of you guys today. And it doesn't matter if it's pastor or a deacon or an elder or a leader of any sort. these, These people of leadership need to be willing to lay down their life for the flock. That doesn't have to mean only the literal sense of the word dying for the sheep, but putting aside their agenda, the things that they desire, the things they want, their own, you know, their own point of view, pushing that aside and say, what's best for the flock? Because that's what the, that's what the shepherd did here. If he laid down on the ground, it wasn't for his own well-being, because I've laid on the ground to sleep at night. It's not so comfortable. It's sometimes cold. It can be scary because you're the only one between you and the wolves. But church leaders, you have to understand what God's called you to. And it may come a shock to some of you guys today, but some preachers are not called to be preachers. Some pastors have no business being behind the pulpit or in the office of a church. They're there for their own agendas. They're there for the paycheck. They're there just because they like to have power and authority. That cannot continue. That cannot continue for a moment. We have to understand as church leaders what it means to lead through the eyes and through the heart of Jesus Christ, seeing the world through his eyes. I want to continue encouraging our church leadership to continue maintaining that spirit of unity among the brethren, be supportive of each other's ministries, And continue to strive for excellence in everything that you do. Going back to Jesus now. So when Jesus was being referenced as the gate, if sheep want to enter or exit that enclosure, they had to go through the gate, go through Jesus. John 14, 6 says it, a little bit of a different way, but we can see the same context being spoken throughout all the Gospels about Jesus being the doorway. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can't go around Jesus, and there's many people who've tried to go around Jesus to get to heaven. That maybe if they give enough offering in, in their offering plate, they can uh, buy their way in. If they say these certain prayers or light these candles or have their, their, their relatives pray a certain way, they can get into heaven later on. It doesn't work that way, church. The only way, and hear me again, the only way to heaven is through the doorway called Jesus Christ. There's no other name under heaven that, can, that a man can be saved except for Jesus Christ. There's no other blood that can atone for our sins except for the blood of Jesus Christ. 
That is the only way that we can receive life and life to the fullest is through the blood and the doorway of Jesus Christ. Don't try to go around it. Go through the door. It's an open door. But it's a narrow door. It does take sacrifice on our part saying, I'm not in charge anymore. I have to lay my life in the hands of Jesus saying, I trust you with all that I have. At John 10, 10, it starts drawing out the differences between a good shepherd and a thief or a bad leader. And I want to read that, and I know many of you guys can recite that by memory because it's great. You guys should be able to recite Scripture. But I want us to look at it for just a second because I want to pull apart all the things that Jesus is saying here in John 10, 10. It says, The thief comes only... You may want to underline the word only in your, in your Bible there. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I like that part. I like having a full life. And through Jesus Christ, we can have a full life. Now, I don't believe our best life is here. I believe our best life is still waiting for us, but we can still enjoy this life. I know many of us that worked yesterday around the, around the church, we had a good time. A little bit of scrapes and elbows, but we, we worked through it, right? It was a good time. Because even through hard work, we enjoyed life because we're doing it for the Lord. So one of the things that Jesus began to show us about the adversary or the thief here is the motives and the things that he would do to cause disruption. See, the thief doesn't come to give things away. He comes to steal the thief is only here to destroy lives. As we go through this, I want to look at the three different areas that he says the devil, and that's who the adversary is. The thief is the devil. The devil wants to steal. So what does he want to steal, honestly, out of your life? He wants to first steal your joy. And after the last few years, there's a lot of joy stealing going on. I mean, with politics, with economics, with social stuff, you name it, even the things that are going on within the church, it's easy for us to lose our joy. But God says, I don't want you to lose your joy. I don't want you to have anyone steal that away from you. But that's what the enemy wants to do, is to steal your joy. He also wants to steal your sanity. He wants to steal your your peace of mind going, what is going on? Because if you look to media, it's easy to get distracted and scared and say, This world is going south quickly. But our eyes don't need to be on the media. It's not supposed to be on the things that we see going on in the here and now. Our eyes should be focused upon Jesus Christ. Remember, we're talking about the good shepherd. Hear the shepherd's voice. The shepherd's not screaming out, run! You're all going to die. The shepherd's not saying that. He goes, I got this under control. So when the enemy wants to come in to steal your peace, steal your joy, steal your sanity, tell him to take a hike. We're not letting it happen anymore. He wants to steal your sleep. I don't know about you guys, but I've had the enemy steal my sleep at night where I can't sleep because i got so much stuff going on. And then I go, dummy, you're a child of God. Lord, take it away. I can wrestle with it for all night long if I wanted to. Or I can say, you know what? You died for that too. Take it away, Lord. I'm sorry. The devil wants you to be depressed and oppressed. He wants to hold you down as much as he can. But read the last part of the passage. I want to give you life and life to the full. I choose that. Amen? I choose that. I choose life. I choose joy today. So the thief also wants to kill. Satan likes to use temptation of sin as a lure or a trap trying to entice us to take the bait because he knows the wages of sin is death so if he can entice the saints to dabble into sin and it doesn't take too much to dabble into sin and it begins to to become a heartache and and, and a hardship inside of you hebrews 12 1 says throw off everything that hinders you everything 
Not just the things that God talks to you about and you don't want to get rid of, you'll hold on to those things. It says throw off everything that hinders you. And the sin that so easily entangles you. I think about it like a fishing net. You can throw a fishing net out and you can catch so many different fish. They get tangled up and they can't find their way free. That's what sin does. Because sin will take you further than you ever thought you were going to go. Sin will keep you longer than you planned on staying. And sin will cost you more than you ever was willing to pay. We have to throw off the sin because the enemy is using that to steal, to kill you, and to destroy. And the third thing that Jesus was talking about is the, is the destruction in John 10, 10. So what is the devil trying to do to destroy our lives? He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your ministry. He wants to destroy your church. He wants to destroy your community. He wants to destroy, destroy the nation. Because if he can do the first two things, he can get the last thing accomplished. When we have no more fight in us because we've been so pushed down by the enemy, what's the point? We're not going to go evangelize next door. We'll quit. And the enemy knows that. But so does God. He says, I want to give you life to the full. But we have to listen to the shepherd's voice. Listen to this voice. The devil's a liar. Each one of you guys need to have that drilled in your head. The devil's a liar. So as soon as you have doubt, nope. That's a lie from the enemy. As we think back about the sheep in this passage that we've been talking about all day, when the sheep woke up in the sheep pen, they didn't have the fear inside them going, oh, I hope the shepherd comes back today. They had that assurance knowing that Jesus was coming back, the shepherd's coming back. We don't have to worry about, is he going to abandon us? No. I will never leave you nor forsake you is what the word says. So you're not going to be left alone. The sheep also don't sit there and worry and wring their, I guess, hooves and say, are we going to find something to eat today? <laughs> what if there's no more grass? What if the brook dries up? What if there's wolves? Not one time do you see a sheep going, no. Because they had so much assurance knowing who their shepherd was. Each one of you guys need to hear this today. When you worry about what's going to be provided for you the next day, stop it. The good shepherd has already planned out a billion years from now. And you're worried about if the grass is going to grow if it rains. That was to me. We worry about stuff that means nothing. And when the answer to prayer comes to us, we're like, oh, I knew that all along. No. I had a huge, huge, I ate the whole pie, the whole humble pie last night. The things I've been worrying about, the things I've been fretting over, for what purpose? Just to have the Holy Spirit go, I told you so. All along, maybe us as good sheep, maybe we should listen to the good shepherd saying, I got this. That even though we may have to go down a dark path for a minute, I'm not going to leave you there. You don't have to worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what the, the economy is going to do. I remember a story about a guy who was fed by ravens. I think he can do it again. That was Elijah, by the way. Stop worrying. Quit giving that devil a foothold in your life. Be a child of God knowing exactly who your shepherd is. We don't do this very often, but I think in just a few minutes, I want to read Psalms 23 together. But before I do, I really feel strong about this. I've been dealing with this in my heart for the last two days. Some of you guys in this room today, you don't know the shepherd. You hear all these stuff that we talked about today about the, the Lord's going to provide and take care of you. But you don't know the shepherd. You've never met him. You never sat down, you never sat down to hear his voice. But I want to give you that opportunity today because I want you to have life to the full. And on your own, you won't have it. Because you're easy pickings for the enemy. I want you to be a part of the family, a part of this flock. Saying, you know what? I'm going to give my heart to Christ. And this is an opportunity for each one of you guys. If you would, just please bow your heads. This will only take a second. This is a life-changing event, but this is nothing between you and the person next to you. This is about you and God.
So I'm going to ask you a point blank question because that's who I am. If you were to die right this second or God came back for his church, would you go to heaven or would you not? What we're dealing with today is heaven and hell. That's it. All the, 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 the glitz and glamour and everything else, that comes secondary. You have to have things right with the Lord before you can do anything else. So right now I'm going to ask you, if you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ to be your good shepherd, and you want to do that today, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand for just a second. I want to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to know who I'm praying for this morning. So if you're here this morning and you want to give your heart completely over to Christ, I would like for you just to raise your hand for just a second. Okay. Give me three more seconds. Three, two, one. You may look at me again. So what you just told me is every single person in this house belongs to the family of God. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to do one last thing with me before we close. I'm going to ask you to stand with me one last time. We're going to read Psalms 23 together. We don't do this very often. But I want you to understand the words that you're reading today and reciting. And allow this to be part of your life. Understanding that sometimes Jesus leads us to places that we don't truly understand, but they're for our own good. And we have no reason to fear because he is with us day and night. So let's read this together if you would, Jared. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me besides quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not fear no e I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is a promise that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever forever we will never have to go home we will be home in the presence of god with our brothers and sisters amen while you're standing let me pray a blessing over you father i thank you for this day i thank you for your word of encouragement i thank you lord for the time of testimony for praise father lord we just give you everything that we have into your hands i say thank you god for loving us Lord, thank you for being our good shepherd. Thank you for looking out over us, Father, providing for us. Even when we're not the greatest sheep, Father, you still love us. And you come back for us every day. So, Lord, I thank you for all that you're doing. I pray, Lord, that you send us out, out of this place, Father, with a mission on our heart to share the love of Jesus with everyone that we encounter. So, Father, give us the boldness. Give us the anointing. Give us the words to say. Give us... Oh, Father, give us obedience in our heart. Go with us now in Jesus' name. Amen.